Hi, I'm Jana Levin. I'm an astrophysicist, and I've been asked to explain gravity in five levels of increasing complexity. Gravity seems so familiar and so everyday, and yet it's this incredibly esoteric, abstract subject that has shaped the way we view the universe on the largest scales, has given us the strangest phenomena in the universe like black holes, that has changed the way we look at the entirety of physics. It's really been a revolution because of gravity. Are you interested in science? Yes. Yes, you are? Yes. Do you know what gravity is? It's something that, so right now, we would be floating if there was no gravity, but since there is gravity, we're sitting right down on these chairs. That's pretty good. So gravity wants to attract us to the Earth, yes. and the Earth to us. But the Earth is so much bigger that even though we're actually pulling the Earth a little bit to us, you don't notice it so much. You know, the moon pulls on the Earth a little bit. Mm -hmm. Just like um, with the ocean tides? Exactly. Well, the moon is such a big body compared to anything else very nearby that it has the larger effect pulling the water of the Earth. But more than the moon, think about the sun pulling on the Earth. We orbit the whole sun just the way the Earth pulls on the moon and causes the moon to orbit us. All of those things are acting on you and me right now. If gravity was too strong, would we be able to get up? That's such a good question. No, we actually couldn't. The moon, gravity is weaker, can almost float between footsteps if you look at the astronauts on the moon. Yeah. On the Earth, it's harder because it's bigger. If you go to a bigger, heavier planet, it gets harder and harder. But there are stars that have died that are so dense that there's no way we could lift our arms, no way we could step or walk. The, yeah. the gravity is just way too strong. Do you know how tall you are? I'm in the fours. In the fours? Maybe four, three. People think that while you're sleeping, your body has a chance to stretch out and gravity isn't crunching you together. But when you're standing and walking or sitting, that gravity contracts your spine ever so slightly. So that in the morning, you might be a little bit taller than in the evening. See if it works for you. Whoa. Was that his last night? Yes. <laughs> Ooh. They say that astronauts in space, definitely their spine elongates. There were two twin astronauts, one who stayed here on Earth and the other who went to the International Space Station and was there for a long time. And when he came back, he was actually taller than his twin brother. Yeah, and that was because gravity wasn't compressing him all the time and he was floating freely in the International Space Station and his spine just kind of elongated. After a while here on Earth, though, he'll readjust. They'll go back to the same size. Have you ever heard of how gravity was discovered? Mm -hmm. Isaac Newton would ponder, how does the Earth cause things to fall? There's a famous story that Isaac Newton was sitting under a tree and the apple fell from the tree and hit him on the head. Ooh. And he had an epiphany and understood this law, this mathematical law for how that works. I don't actually think it's a true story though. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a good story. So Isaac Newton realized that even if you're heavier, you will fall at the same rate as something much lighter, that that's the same. Once you hit the ground, if you're heavier, you'll hit the ground with much greater force, but you will hit the ground at the same time. So if we both drop down from a plane, we would both um, land at the same time, but yep. you would land heavier? Yep, so like a penny from the Empire State Building will fall at the same rate as a bowling ball. Oh my god. Yeah, amazing. Wanna try it? Um, yeah. A light object? See how light that is? That's... Very light? Yeah. And a heavy object? Oh my god. <laughs> they look the same, but this is much heavier, right? Okay, so try it. Just try holding your arms out front and a little higher maybe, give them a chance to drop, and then drop them. Did they fall at the same time? Did yeah. they hit at the same time? So Isaac Newton, he was also the one who realized that that's the same force that keeps the moon in orbit around the Earth and the Earth in orbit around the sun. And that's a huge leap. Here he is looking at just things around him and then looks at the stars and has this really big realization that that's actually the same force. So what have you learned 
today talking about gravity? I've learned that the person that learned about the apple. Newton. Um, he was learning about gravity just about what he saw on this planet. I also learned that if you drop one light thing and one heavy thing at the same height at the same time, they're both going to drop at the same time, but one's going to drop a little heavier than the other. That's beautiful. I'm impressed. So, Maria, you're in high school? Yeah, I'm a junior. And are you studying any sciences in high school? I'm taking physics right now. Do you think of yourself as curious about science? Well, there are like some things that interest me and mm -hmm. others that bore me, so it like <laughs> depends. <laughs> what interests you? Well, like I'm a gymnast, so mm -hmm. like in physics they talk about like force and stuff, and then I think of like how I use physics in like my own life. What's your impression of what gravity is? I think that if there's like no gravity, everyone would like float everywhere. It like mm -hmm. pulls things down and mm -hmm. without it, like everything would just be like chaos. So you're saying gravity pulls things down, yet we've launched things into space. Have you ever wondered how we do that? What is it, like a slingshot? Like if you pull something back enough, it'll like go in the opposite direction? Well, that's true. We do use slingshot technology once things are out in the solar system. So for instance, we use Jupiter and other planets so that when some of the spacecraft gets close, it'll slingshot around and it'll cause it to like speed up. But mostly around the Earth, gravity pulls things down. So when we want to send a rocket into space, when we want to go to the moon, when we want to send supplies to the International Space Station. The trick is to get something moving fast enough that it escapes the gravitational pull of the Earth. Have you heard the expression, what goes up must come down? Mm -hmm. It's actually not true. <laughs> if you throw it fast enough, you can actually get something that doesn't come back down again. <laughs> and that's basically how rocket launches work. You have to get the rocket for the Earth to go more than 11 kilometers a second. Think of how fast it is, just one breath and it's gone 11 kilometers. If you get it to go that fast, it's not gonna come back down again. So you know the International Space Station, where, which is orbiting the Earth? That's going around the Earth at like 17,000 miles an hour. It has no engines anymore. The engines are turned off. So it's just, they're falling forever. <laughs> so once it's out there, it's not coming back down as long as it's cruising like that. And like, does the gravity pull it, or is it just like floating? In a weird way, that is gravity pulling it. So have you ever um, had a yo-yo where you swing it around like this? The string is pulling it in at all times, but you've also given it this angular momentum. And as long as you give it the angular momentum, pulling it in actually keeps it in orbit. And so the Earth is pulling it in at all times, so that's why it doesn't just travel off in a straight line. It keeps coming back around. So it's funny, people think that the International Space Station is so far away that they're not feeling gravity. And that's not the case at all. They're absolutely feeling gravity. They're just cruising so fast that even though they're being pulled in, they never get pulled to the surface. It's like that, um, the ride at the roller coasters where you like, yeah. you go in and it spins super fast and you can't feel it spinning fast, but yeah. like your pulls. You feel pinned to the back. Yeah. It's exactly like that. There's something called the equivalence principle where people realized, especially Einstein, that if you were in outer space in a rocket ship and it was dark and painted and it was accelerating at exactly the right rate, you actually wouldn't know if you were sitting on the floor of a building around the Earth or if you were in a rocket ship that was accelerating. That's crazy. <laughs> you ever had that experience where you're sitting in a train and the other one moves and for a second you're not sure if you're the one moving? Yeah, because... I go on the train every day to go to school, but I never feel like I'm moving when I'm in the train. And, and then I'm like, wait, what? That's because in some sense, you're really not. Imagine you're in this train and it's going near the speed of light relative to the platform, but it's so smooth. Then you should be in a situation in which there's no meaning to your absolute motion. There's no absolute motion. So that if you throw a ball up, you might think from the outside of the platform, be confused that when gravity pulls that back down, it's gonna hit you or something, that it'll land in your palm as surely as if you were in your living room. Isn't that, that kind of crazy? Sense. So imagine you are an astronaut and you are floating in empty space. You can't see anything. There's no stars, there's no Earth. You can ask yourself, am I moving? There's really no way for you to tell. So you would probably conclude, well, I'm not moving. So then your friend Marina comes cruising past you. Maybe she's going thousands of kilometers a second. And you say, Marina, you're cruising at like thousands of kilometers a second. You're going so fast. But she had just done the same experiment. She was just floating in space, thinking, you know, am I moving? There's no way to know which one of you is moving. And there's no meaning to the absolute motion. The only thing that's true is that you're in relative motion. 
That's true. You both agree you are in relative motion, and that's clear. But neither of you can say it's actually you who's moving and I'm stationary. <laughs> I don't even know what to say to that. So let me tell you the, where it gets really crazy. <laughs> so let's say you and Marina are floating in space and you can't tell who's moving. Let's say you both see a flash of light. The flash of light comes from somewhere, you don't know where. Mm -hmm. So you measure the speed of light to be 300,000 kilometers per second. But here comes Marina and she's racing at the light pulse as far as you can tell. Two cars driving towards each other seem like they're going faster towards each other than somebody who's standing still relative to one of the cars, right? Yeah. So you would say, oh, Marina's gonna measure a different speed of light. But she comes back and she says, nope, 300,000 kilometers per second. Because from her perspective, she's standing still. And the laws of physics had better be the same for her. The speed of light is a fact of nature. That's as true as the strength of gravity. And the two of you are in this quandary because of one of you is the preferred person who correctly measures the speed of light, that ruins everything about the idea of the relativity of motion. Which one of you should it be? So Einstein decides they must both measure the same speed of light. How could that possibly, possibly be the case? And he thinks, well, if speed is how far you travel, your spatial distance in a certain amount of time, then there must be something wrong with space and time. And he goes from the constancy of the speed of light and a respect for this idea of relativity to the idea that space and time must not be the same for you and for Marina. And that's how he gets to the idea of the relativity of space and time. <laughs> you have the best expression on your history. <laughs> it's pretty wild. But that is a starting point, actually, of the whole theory of relativity. That starting point leads to this complete revolution in physics where we suddenly have a big bang in black holes in space-time, just from that one simple starting point. So is your impression of gravity different than when we started the conversation? Yeah, because like I knew that like when I was on the train I didn't feel like I was moving, but I didn't know like why or that it was a thing and I wasn't crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a really deep principle. Uh -huh. And what about the theory of gravity? I don't know. Like, usually when I just heard gravity, it's like from my coaches, but I didn't know, like, it was like all these things. Mm -hmm. It's like a big paradigm. So you're in college. Yeah. And what are you studying in college? I'm a physics major. So from your perspective, mm -hmm. how would you describe gravity? I'm taught that it's a force. Uh, it's described by inverse law, but I also know that it's a field. And there's a recent discovery with like gravitational waves, although I don't know like the specific details of the, mm -hmm. about that. So when you say it's an inverse square law, yeah. that means that the closer you are, yeah. the more strongly you feel the gravitational pull. Yeah. And that makes sense. Yeah. There's very few things that are stronger when you're further apart. Yeah. So you can also mm -hmm. think of a gravitational field, something that permeates all of space. Even though the Earth is three stories below us, it's not as though it's pulling at us from a distance, mm -hmm. right? It's, yeah. We're actually interacting with the field at this point, and uh -huh. there's a real interaction right here at this point. Mm -hmm. And that's nice because people were worried that if things acted at a distance, yeah. that the way the old fashioned inverse square force law yeah. describes it, that it was as spooky as like mind bending a spoon, mm -hmm. that it was like telekinesis. You know, if you don't touch something, mm -hmm. how do you affect it? And so the first step was to start to think of gravity as a field that permeates all of space. And it's weaker, very far from the earth, mm -hmm. and it's stronger, very close to the earth. So one way to think of this field is as a field that's really describing a curved space time mm -hmm. that is everywhere. Forget the difficulty of the math, just the intuition comes from two kind of simple observations. One was uh, what Einstein described as the happiest thought of his life. So right now, you might feel heavy in your chair, and we might feel heavy on the floor in our feet or, or standing in an elevator cab. And Einstein would have said, well, what does the chair have to do with it? Or the floor, or the elevator, those aren't gravitational objects. And so he wanted to eliminate them. And one way to do the thought experiment is to imagine standing in an elevator that you can't see out of a black mm -hmm. box. And imagine the cable is cut and you and the elevator begin to fall. So I'm free fall? You're in total free fall. Mm -hmm. Now, because things fall at the same rate, yeah. including the elevator and you, yeah. you can actually float in the elevator. Mm -hmm. If you just floated in the elevator, the two of you would drop. And you might not even know you're falling. You could mm -hmm. take an apple and drop it in front of you, and it would float in front of you. You would actually experience 
weightlessness. It's called the equivalence principle. It was Einstein's happiest thought that what you're really doing when you're experiencing gravity mm -hmm. isn't being heavy in your chair, it's falling weightlessly in the gravitational field. And that was the first step, to mm -hmm. think of gravity as weightlessness and falling. I know like a zero gravity experiences yeah. are done with uh, planes, I believe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You can make somebody look like they're in the International Space Station mm -hmm. by flying up in a plane yeah. and then just free falling. The plane just drops out of the air. And while it's falling, mm -hmm. they will float weightlessly, and there's been a lot of experiments about it, but you don't want it to end unhappily. So the plane <laughs> has to scoop back up, yeah. and then you see them become pinned to the floor of the plane. Oh, okay. Because then the plane is interrupting their fall. So that's the first thought. And then the next is, what is the shape that's chased. So if you uh -huh. were floating in empty space, really empty space, yeah. and you had an apple, mm -hmm. and you threw the apple, what shape do you think it would chase, the path? Well, if I threw it straight, I would think it would go straight. Yeah, it would just yeah. go straight. But if you did that on the Earth, what would happen? Uh, it would just go down. Yeah, but it would, cause, it would chase a curve. Oh, yeah. It would chase an yeah. arc. Yeah. Right? And the f faster you throw it, mm -hmm. the kind of longer the arc. Mm -hmm. So the second step mm -hmm. to thinking about curved space-time is to say that when things fall freely around a body like the Earth, mm -hmm. they trace curved paths as though space-time itself, space itself, was curved. Oh. And so you had yeah, that yeah, moment, yeah, yeah. I saw it on your face, you went, oh. <laughs> so that's the intuition. Mm -hmm. That's how Einstein gets from thinking that space-time is curved from the idea that, well, there's this field that permeates all of space, and mm -hmm. what it's really describing is the curves that things fall along. And from there, it's a very long path to finding the mathematics mm -hmm. and the right description. That's really hard. But that intuition is so elegant and so beautiful and just comes from these two simple thought experiments. That's amazing. Isn't it kind yeah. of amazing? <laughs> <laughs> so you described learning in a class about light the theory of special relativity, mm -hmm. where Einstein is really adhering to the constancy of the speed of light and questioning the absolute nature mm -hmm. of space and time. And it seems like that has nothing to do with gravity. But he later begins to think about the incompatibility of gravity with his theory of relativity. So suppose the sun were to disappear tomorrow, mm -hmm. some like evil genius comes and just <laughs> figures out a way to evaporate the sun. In Newton's understanding of gravity, we would instantaneously know about it all the way over here at the Earth. Mm -hmm. And that's incompatible with the concept that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. No information, not even information about the sun, could mm -hmm. possibly travel faster than the speed of light. So we shouldn't know about what happened to the sun for a full eight minutes which is the time it would take light to travel to us. And so he begins to question why gravity is so incompatible with relativity, but he already knows he's thinking about space and time in relativity. So then he gets to his general theory of relativity mm -hmm. where he realizes if I eliminate everything but just the gravitational field of, let's say, the Earth, and I look at how things fall, and I see that they follow curves, mm -hmm. well, then he realizes that space and time don't just contract or dilate, that they can really warp, that they can bend, and that they can curve. And then he finds a way to make gravity compatible with relativity by saying, if the sun were to disappear tomorrow, mm -hmm. the curves that the sun imprinted in space-time would actually be into ripple. And those are the gravitational waves. And they mm -hmm. would change, and they would flatten out because the sun was no longer there. Yeah. And that would take the light travel time to get to us to tell us that the sun was gone. Uh -huh. And then we would stop orbiting and just travel along a straight line. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope it doesn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think you walked away with? What do you think you learned from well, the Well, I learned more about the intuitions behind mm -hmm. the concept. Um, because we already just do the problems, but sometimes you get lost in the math. But like speaking like this, it really helps build my intuition. Yeah, it, it does, it does mm -hmm. for me too. So thank you. <laughs>
and the stuff that's left behind that doesn't get blown away collapses into a tiny compact blob called a neutron star. So what I love about neutron stars personally is that mm -hmm. they're kind of city-sized. Right? That's right. They're it's, about the size yeah. of a city, so you're imagining yeah. something more than the mass of the sun. Yep, or about the mass of the sun yeah. condensed to the size of a city. It's dense enough that one teaspoonful would weigh about a billion tons here on Earth. Now, that makes the gravitational field incredibly mm -hmm. strong. That's right. right, around the neutron star. Mm -hmm. So what would happen if we were on a neutron star because we of the would, gravity? We would immediately be crushed into the ground. I think our bodies would be shred into their subatomic particles. So what's the connection between neutron stars and black holes? So as I understand it, a black hole is sort of like a neutron star's big brother. It's more intense. Uh, if you have so much matter when a star is collapsing that it can't hold itself up, it collapses to a black hole. And those are so dense that space-time breaks down in some way or another. Black holes are so amazing that where the neutron star stops and there's something actually there, mm -hmm. right? There's a material there. If it's so heavy, it becomes a black hole, so it keeps falling. Once the uh, event horizon of the black hole forms, which is the shadow, the curve that's so strong that not even light can escape, the material keeps falling. And like you said, maybe space-time breaks down right at the center there, but whatever happens, the star's gone. That black hole is empty. So in a weird way, black holes are a place and not a thing. So is there a sensible way to talk about what's inside a black hole, or is that, should you think of it as th there is no space-time inside There a isn't hole? a sensible way to talk about it yet, and that probably means that's where Einstein's theory of gravity as a curved space-time is beginning to break down, and we need to take the extra step of going to some kind of quantum theory of gravity, mm -hmm. and we don't have that yet. So even though the black hole isn't completely understood, we do know that they form astronomically, that in the universe things like neutron stars form and things like black holes form. The consequences are very much speaking to this curved space-time. So for instance, if two black holes orbit each other, they're like mallets on a drum and they actually cause space-time to ring. And it's very much part of gravitation. The ringing of space-time itself mm -hmm. we call gravitational waves. And this was what something Einstein thought about right away in 1915, 1916. He was thinking about that. Those waves are very exciting for me too because neutron stars orbiting each other also give off gravitational waves and we might be able to get some data about neutron star material from that kind of signal. Yes, they ring space-time also like a drum and you can record the sound of that ringing after a billion years when it's traveled through the universe, but then the next thing that happens is those neutron stars collide. Mm -hmm. And because of this incredibly high energy state of matter, which you study, it becomes this firework of um, different explosions. It's really quite spectacular. That's right. In fact, when we recorded that for the first time with gravitational waves, we then pointed telescopes at it and were able to see it optically as well, and that gave scientists a lot of data. Yeah, it was, um, to my knowledge, the most widely studied astronomical event in the history of humanity. Wow. So that's when amazing. the gravitational waves were recorded and they realized, oh, this sounds like you can reconstruct the shape and size of the mallets of the drum from the sound, these sounds like neutron stars colliding, not black holes. And so, like you said, there was a trigger for satellites and experiments all over the world to point roughly in the direction that the sound was coming from. So from your point of view, I mean, there were like two superconducting giant magnets mm -hmm. colliding, an experiment you could never do on Earth that's just of the most tremendous scales and, and peculiarities of matter. Absolutely. I've heard statistics like many Earth masses worth of gold were created, forged in the yeah. uh, neutron star collision that caused that. We used to think that most elements in the universe were created in supernova, which is when stars explode because there's so much violent activity at the center that you need that kind of energy to create new elements. The way you do in a bomb, it's basically nuclear fusion. Sure, but we now think that that kind of fusion happens when two neutron stars collide. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about it, you have two massive blobs of neutrons. Mm -hmm. When you smush them together, mm -hmm. you've got neutrons colliding. It creates the conditions where new elements can be created. Yeah, it's um, and, amazing. It's literally populating the periodic table. Yes, we now think that most of the heavy elements mm -hmm. after some number mm -hmm. are created in neutron star collisions. Mm -hmm. So you 
are already a PhD student, you know a lot about gravity, but what do you think you've taken away from this conversation? Well, I've definitely taken away that the way that we think about gravity today is very different from how Newton thought about it. Mm -hmm. um, and that even though we have a very good understanding, there's lots of things that we don't fully understand. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot of questions to be answered, which I think is really exciting. See, you're a scientist. <laughs> Isn't the best part being able to ask the questions? Oh, yeah. So we've been talking about gravity from Newton and celestial bodies, the Earth, the Moon, pulling on each other in the conventional sense of gravity being an attractive force to the Earth creating curves in space-time. Then we moved on to just diffuse seas of energy and space-time as the real universe and gravitation is really just talking about space-time in general. And here we are. And you're really hardcore in theoretical physics. Where would you take the exposition of gravity from that point? Well, one thing is quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is the most successful theory in the history of science. It explains the most different phenomena the most precisely. Yet, many people would still say we don't understand even the basics of it. So when we think about quantum mechanics, we think about particles and their quantum charges. And in the Feynman way, the way that Feynman taught us, you know, they come in and they exchange a force carrier, and then they come out again. So that's how we think of an electron and light scattering, for instance, or something like that. And the language that Einstein gave us is so different. It's completely geometric. It's all of this space time. And it's also unnecessary. Yeah, for me, the, the beauty of the theory of gravity is, is the way Einstein formulated it as a theory of geometry, mm -hmm. of curved space. Mm -hmm in time. I think like you, that's one of the things that really pulled me into it. Is there really space time or are we just using unnecessary language because it's elegant and we like it and it's beautiful? Well, I think there is really space time in the sense that it, it's a description that works really well. So mm -hmm. there has to be something right about it. I mean, if we're going to talk about what's really, really underlying that yeah. and we're going to put quantum mechanics into the mix, mm -hmm. then there should be some quantum mechanical wave function for space-time. You should be able to take two different space-times mm -hmm. and add them together, because one of the crazy things about quantum mechanics, as you know, is take add any, the waves together. Yeah, any two states, any two yeah. possible states of the mm -hmm. world, you can just literally put a plus sign between them. And that's a, that's a sensible state. That's a good state. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. So do you think that there's some sense in which we shouldn't be thinking about individual universes, individual space-times, but we should be thinking about superpositions of space-times? Yeah, I think so. I think if you were to go far enough back in the history of the universe, back to when it was very, very dense, very mm -hmm. small, and when quantum mechanics was certainly important, mm -hmm. then it must have been like that. I mean, if we believe that the dominant standard mm -hmm. model of cosmology, something had to produce the density perturbations the things mm -hmm. that seeded all the galaxies and stars and mm -hmm. us, everything else in the world. So there's a galaxy over there, let's say, and not over there. Mm -hmm. So how did that happen? Why is there a galaxy mm -hmm. there and not there? Right. In the standard theory, as you know, that was a quantum event, a random event. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that it happened there and not there because you mm -hmm. flipped a coin. It actually happened in both places. There's got to be a wave function mm -hmm. where in one branch of the wave function is a galaxy there and not there, and in the other branch it's the opposite. So when we're talking about the multiverse or the Big Bang, we are really talking about gravity ultimately. And we're talking about how a theory of gravitation, which we now think of as a theory of space-time, has a quantum explanation, has a quantum paradigm imposed on it that will help us understand these things. And we don't have that yet. One of the things that I think is so amazing is that the terrains in which we're going to understand quantum gravity are very few, right? It's the Big Bang, because that's where we know that quantum and gravity both were called into action. And there's black holes. One of the most interesting discoveries, of course, Hawking's discovery, kick-started mm -hmm. a kind of crisis, right, in thinking about why quantum mechanics and gravity were so knocking heads. It was one of the most beautiful examples. Sure, yeah, it's, it is a beautiful, beautiful idea. So first of all, to be totally clear, mm -hmm. though, we've never observed Hawking radiation, which mm -hmm. is what he predicted directly. I don't think very many people doubt that it's there. But yeah, mm -hmm. Hawking discovered mathematically that when you have a black hole, mm -hmm. it's got an event horizon, it's mm -hmm. got a surface which is a point of no return. If you fall through that surface, mm -hmm. no matter what you have, no matter how powerful of a rocket you got, even if you beam a flashlight back behind you in the direction you fall from, nothing escapes, not even light. It all gets sucked in and spaghettified and mm -hmm. destroyed at the singularity <laughs> or something, something happens, mm -hmm. but it doesn't get out. But in quantum mechanics, you can't really pin down the location of something precisely. Mm -hmm. If you try to pin down an electron in a tiny circuit in a microchip, sometimes you discover that it's not actually there and then your computer crashes. This is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in reality. Yeah. You can't precisely say 
where the electron is, and you can't precisely say how quickly it's moving. Exactly, yeah. So when you get the blue screen of death, that might be because of quantum mechanics. <laughs> right. You know, you try to pin something down near a black hole. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a surface. It's got mm -hmm. a particular radius for mm -hmm. a round black hole. And you want to say something is inside or outside mm -hmm. it. Well, you can't absolutely say that in quantum mechanics. And right. this kind of uncertainty produces mm -hmm. a radiation, mm -hmm. which you can think of as pulling some of the energy out of the black hole. The black mm -hmm. hole is formed out of some mass, mm -hmm. and there's an energy in that. Mm -hmm. You can think of pulling some energy out of that and sending it off to infinity in the form mm -hmm. of particles being mm -hmm emitted. Yeah. And what Hawking found is that it's a thermal spectrum. It looks like a hot or not so yeah. hot for a large black hole, but like an oven, the kind of radiation right. that comes out of a right. cast iron. This idea that the darkest phenomenon in the universe actually is forced to radiate quantum particles is pretty wild. I think everyone understood that, the, that it was a correct calculation, but I don't think a lot of people understood the implications that it meant something really terrible was happening because this black hole, which could have been made of who knows what, is disappearing into these quantum particles, which in some sense have nothing to do with the material that went in. So do you think that's a big crisis? The black hole evaporates, the information is lost. It's a crisis because of some of the details of it, but mm -hmm. I would say the way you just described it, I mean, if I build a big bonfire mm -hmm. or an incinerator mm -hmm. and I throw an encyclopedia into it, mm -hmm. good luck reconstructing what was in that encyclopedia. Right. The information is lost for all practical purposes. Practical purposes. Yeah. So this is a huge crisis because either quantum mechanics is wrong, and as you described, it's the most accurately tested paradigm in the history of physics. How could it be wrong, right? Or the event horizon is letting information out and violating one of the most sacred principles of relativity. One thing about quantum mechanics is that anytime you have a state of the world and another state of the world, you can, mm -hmm. you can literally add them together and get a third possible state, as mm -hmm. crazy as that sounds. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to have a quantum theory of gravity, mm -hmm. then we can't really talk about there being a black hole or not a black hole, <laughs> right? Or an event horizon or not, or not an event, event horizon. horizon. Because yeah. we could always take a, a state that had an event horizon in it and a state that doesn't or has the event horizon in a slightly different mm -hmm. position maybe mm -hmm. and add them together. Mm -hmm. So the existence or position of an event horizon can't possibly be you know, determined as a fact any more mm -hmm. than the position of an electron is mm -hmm. determined. So I think that's the loophole. That's a nice way of looking at it so that you're not actually violating classical relativity once you're in a regime where the wave function has really peaked around a very well-defined state. That's right, and one of, one of, one of the most exciting developments <laughs> mm -hmm. in the last 10 or 20 years is called holography. And yeah. it's called holography because mm -hmm. a hologram is a two-dimensional surface that creates a three-dimensional image. Mm -hmm. It's got sort of 3D information built into it. Right. And this, in a fundamental way, really has that three or higher dimensional information built into it. Yeah. It's exactly the same mm -hmm. as this theory of gravity in mm -hmm. more dimensions. Yeah, so one of the things I like to think about with holography is that I can pack a certain amount of information in a black hole. I mean, you can literally think of it as like throwing things into it. Let's say I have information in some volume and I'm under the illusion that I can just keep packing information in that volume as much as the volume will contain. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I'll make a black hole mm -hmm. and I'll find out that the maximum amount of information I can pack into anything in the entire universe is what I can pack on the area, right? And since area is projecting the illusion maybe of volume, maybe the whole world is just a hologram. It's not a principle that only applies to black holes. It's saying that... If this theory of quantum gravity is correct, then this whole three-dimensionality is an utter illusion, and really the universe is two-dimensional. That's, That's crazy. True. <laughs> and as practically speaking, you mentioned before in our conversation that it's really interesting that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is a practical limit now on microchips. Yeah. Right? If we make microchips much, much smaller than they already are, even as they already are, mm -hmm. it, it causes errors because you don't know that right. the electrons in. If holography, if this limit on how much information you can ever pack, if that ever became a limit, yeah. as far as we know, that's an absolute limit. Right? We started off with, with clay tablets, mm -hmm. not so much information yeah. per cubic. Mm -hmm centimeter yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Then we had written stuff that's getting mm -hmm. better. Encyclopedias mm -hmm. with thin paper that's even yeah. better. <laughs> CDs. Right. Hard the smaller and smaller space trying to pack a denser and denser invasion. Eventually we'd make a black hole. Yeah, at some point <laughs> you try to <laughs> fill up your encyclopedia with knowledge and you get swallowed up by a black hole. Right. So, <laughs> exactly. And think, the most knowledge you could ever have would only be a two -dimensional, on a two-dimensional surface. Right, and as big yeah. as the universe yeah. and then you're done. Yeah. So, you know, it, yeah. not likely that we're going to hit that limit anytime soon. Do you think it's possible that Gravity is really ultimately just quantum mechanics and doesn't exist at all in the fundamental ways that we've been talking about so far, like the Newtonian way and the space-time way, that those are just these kind of macroscopic illusions. And sometimes I talk about it in terms of temperature. Temperature is not a thing. There's no single thing called temperature, right? It's a macroscopic illusion that comes from the collective behavior, really quantum behavior, of random motions of atoms. And is it possible that the whole of gravity is like some kind of emergent 
illusion from what's really quantum phenomena underlying it. Well, if we buy the idea of holography, then mm -hmm. absolutely, that's, yeah. that's for sure. That's what, that's what it's telling us. Mm -hmm. Although, which side is the illusion and which side is the reality? Right. They're the same. I mean, temperature's still great to talk about. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean we shouldn't talk about temperature. I mean, right. we should absolutely adjust our thermostats and talk about temperature. But if we look at it closer and closer and closer, we realize there's not a thing in the world that has as a quantum value temperature yeah. isolated. And so maybe there is no such thing as gravity isolated from quantum mechanics. Right, so I guess with the holographic description we've got two sides which mm -hmm. are which are actually secretly the same. On one side there's mm -hmm. definitely no gravity. On the other side, well, it's a quantum theory of gravity, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. But the point is you can get it out, it's equivalent to this theory right. would definitely So that's like just saying there's, the, the idea of a dual description is just saying there's a perfect dictionary between these two descriptions. Yeah. And so to belabor which one's real is silly. It's right. like saying is French real or is English real. Right, yeah, an example I like to give is if you take some extra dimensions, mm -hmm and you compactify them, let's say mm -hmm. just one. All that is, it's exactly equivalent to whatever particles you had, whatever fields you had in your original theory before yeah. you added it. You just add an infinite tower of new yeah. particles with certain properties that are all mm -hmm. easy to calculate. For me, it's a question of which, one, which description is most useful. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to say gravity is an illusion and it's all quantum, that's great, but then you fall down the stairs and bang your head. Yeah. So, you know, it's sort of like there's, there's a description that, uh, that works pretty well. Yeah, you don't that's, go to the doctor and yeah, say, yeah. Heisenberg uncertainty <laughs> principle caused a series of fluctuations. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. Can you help me? So there's so many open questions. The fact that there are all these fundamental issues that we really don't understand, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, there's all of these moving parts that fit together so neatly. There's definitely something that's working here, mm -hmm. but ultimately what is going to emerge from that, what structure is lying under it, we just don't know. But I think yeah. mm -hmm. the fact that there are so many fundamental questions that we just don't know the answer to, that mm -hmm. is an opportunity, that's exciting, mm -hmm. it's great. Thanks so much for coming. Thank it's you. It's really it good to pleasure. have you here. Thank you very much, John. It was my pleasure. <laughs>